You can begin to open your Bibles to uh, Mark chapter 10, and uh, let's take a moment and pray. Father, we come before you, and God, we're thankful um, just for the opportunity to be here this morning, the opportunity to have community and fellowship with one another. God, I'm thankful for the privilege and the opportunity to share your word. God, I pray that it would be your words and not my words. God, I pray that I would not get in the way of anything that you want to do. God, I pray that you would open our hearts, um, open our minds, open our spirits to your communication and to your words. God, we love you, and we pray that all of this is for your glory. We pray it in your name. Amen. The year was 1987, and I was 10 years old, which immediately dates me. You either feel old or young, based on how old you were in 1987. I was getting ready to go into fifth grade, and little did I know that this was the moment that I was going to meet my future wife. I walked into Mrs. Ferris's classroom, and I mean, I wouldn't have noticed her except for the fact that I knew that she went to the same church that I did, and I didn't think she acted much like a Christian. So <laughs> you can see I was a little judgmental 10-year-old. Um, and I, I was also not the nicest guy. In fact, our greatest memory of fifth grade together, and I guarantee you she would have the same one that I did, uh, her from being mortified by it and me from being ashamed and embarrassed now by it, but we had a talent show, as you often have in wonderful fifth grade classrooms, a talent show, and at the time I had been playing the piano for some time, and my wife, who is far better at piano than I am, she's wonderful and I'm terrible now, but I had been playing longer than her, and at the time, she had put together this wonderful little classical piece that she was going to play called Furelise. And if you're familiar with piano or classical music at all, you've heard it. I won't try and hum it for you anyway. It's a piece that has some different parts, and she played the first part. I had played the whole thing, because I was a master of the piano at 10 years old. So she gets done playing her little part, and she was so proud, so happy of, and I stood up and I said, where's the rest of it? That was me at 10 years old. And yet God chose to save me anyway. So, um, so she, of course, was horrified by this, and understandably so, and, and I was a tool. And, and little, I would have never guessed at that, at that moment, one, that we would ever have some sort of, you know, very immature sixth grade romance that lasted for like five months until she realized I was a moron and dumped me. And then, again, at age 14, we would come back together and this time, though not the most godly relationship in the world by any stretch, from 14 on until when we got married, God was faithful. And how was I to know that 11 years after that day in fifth grade, this would be us standing before God and all of our friends? That was really nice of you. Oh, instead of laughter, because <laughs> most of the time when I show that to people, I get a lot of laughter because, yes, that is yellow hair. That is, that is not natural. There's nothing natural about that now or then. Um, you can't really see it, but at the bottom of that picture, you can see I'm wearing Doc Martin saddle shoes, which were very in style at the time. My wife was mortified that I was going to do that because she said the veil looked terrible. I think she looks awesome. I think she looks wonderful. And if you notice, there's someone standing in between us there that you should recognize. Tim Mon married us. It's a picture of a picture, so it's not very good. You can't see the size of his glasses, which are like, like this, which would have been better if I could have gotten that a little clearer. But this reminds me of God's grace in my life. I grew up in a church. I grew up knowing what a man was supposed to be or what a husband was supposed to be. My wife grew up knowing what a wife was supposed to be, what a woman of God was supposed to be. But when we got married, and obviously you can tell it looks like we were 12. We were older than 12. But we got married young, and the first two years of marriage was a nightmare. I mean, I never knew how sinful I was until I got married. I never knew how selfish I was. I never knew how selfish she was until we got married. She would say the exact same thing. And maybe you've experienced that. And the passage that we're coming today to today in Mark chapter 10 these Pharisees, these religious leaders are coming and questioning Jesus about his views on divorce. And man, this is so pertinent to us today in the church. I remember thinking over and over again in those first two years of marriage, all right, God, I, said you, I know you said no divorce. I know you said, I, so divorce is not an option. 
Because if it had been in my mind, we would not still be together. But God's grace is amazing. And maybe that's the story that some of you share, and you can look back at times like that, like I do, and love the memory of my wedding and how awesome it was, and remember those first few years and think, gosh, God, you taught me a ton, and you were so faithful when I was so sinful. And when we look at our world around us, and we look at statistics, and I've learned not to trust statistics. They're like all over the place, and usually we love bad statistics, so we highlight those and probably share a bunch of statistics that are worse than they are. But here's what I do know. I've been doing student ministries for 15 years, and I serve and talk to more students from broken homes than I ever have before. Divorce is not something that's getting better. It's getting worse. And I'm talking about in the church as well as outside of the church. I don't know what statistics to trust. I just know that when I talk to Curtis, our counseling pastor, and I say, how many cases of, of kind of marriage counseling do you get? He says eight or nine out of ten that come in for counseling, marriage counseling is it. It's this vital relationship, this opportunity to show the world Jesus more than any other opportunity in our lives through our marriage. And it's so tough because we're full of so much sin, because we don't get it. And so it makes sense that these Pharisees are coming to Jesus asking about divorce. And I, I want to say this as we start, too, that I know for many of you, this is like, this is right in the wheelhouse because you're sitting here with your wife, you're sitting here with your husband, and you're like, okay, cool, we're going to talk about marriage. And some of you are going, okay, time for me to put in my headphones because I am not married. I am 13 years old, and I don't need to know anything about this. Or I'm not married now, and I don't plan on being for a while because the last one I had was terrible. Here's what I want you to, to know. The principles that affect divorce and marriage are so gospel-centric, are so related to all of life, that one, this will be beneficial to you just because it relates to the gospel. But two, statistically speaking, most of you who are younger and maybe not married yet, you're going to be someday. And you don't become a great husband when you say, I do. And you don't become a great wife because you want to. You understand and you do those things because you've decided ahead of time to follow God's word, to follow his prescription for love, for marriage, for divorce, for remarriage. And so let's learn together today from Mark chapter 10, kind of what the Bible has to say about this ugly word of divorce. And then I want to just spend some time encouraging us and encouraging one another with ways that we can nurture our marriage because divorce is not something that we want more of. It is something that we want less of. No doubt. Amen? All right, the passage that we're in is Mark chapter 10. And, and you can turn there, like I, like I mentioned, but the passage that I'm actually going to use, and I'll have it up on the screen, it is kind of a, a, a combining of Matthew chapter 19 and Mark chapter 10. They both reflect the same situation from Matthew's perspective and from Mark's perspective, and they have a couple little uniquenesses to them that I think the best thing for us to do to get the fullest picture of this scene is to kind of combine them. So what you'll see on the screen is basically going to be the combination of Mark chapter 10 and Matthew chapter 19, which gives us this great picture of what's going on. And here's how it goes. Follow along on the screen. And some Pharisees came up to him, testing him, and began to question him whether it was lawful for a man to divorce his wife, saying, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any cause at all? And he answered and said to them, What did Moses command you? And they said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. And he answered and said, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning of creation made them male and female, and said, For this cause a man shall leave his father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Consequently, they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. And then they said to him, the Pharisees, Why then did Moses command to give her a certificate and send her away? And Jesus said to them, Because of the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this commandment. Moses permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it has not been this way. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for immorality, and marries another woman, commits adultery. 
And in the house, the disciples began to question him or Jesus again about this. And he said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another man, she is committing adultery. Now, it's helpful to understand some context. It's helpful to understand kind of where Jesus is at, where these Pharisees are coming from. We've seen them before if you've been with us for some of the study in Mark. They're the kind of the religious leaders of the day, the religious elite, who have kind of made a bunch of rules and a bunch of laws that they're constraining and telling the people that they have to follow. They'd like to think that they are really, really holy people. And they like to think that not because of Christ's sacrifice. They like to think it because they are such good at fo- they're so good at following rules. They're such good rule followers. And Jesus has run-ins with them often because, as you know, Jesus is not a rule follower. In fact, Jesus is preaching the opposite of what they're preaching. They have this idea in their mind that somehow they need to earn God's favor and be good enough for God. And Jesus is saying, you can't. You can't. And when Jesus comes to this section, he is traveling or making his last journey from Capernaum, north of the Sea of Galilee, down to Jerusalem. And so he comes down around the Sea of Galilee and he's following the Jordan River, basically down towards the Dead Sea. And eventually he's going to get to Jerusalem, which is kind of just west of the, of the north end of the Dead Sea. But before he gets there, he makes a stop in this region, which is just to the east of the Jordan River, just to the north of the Dead Sea, and it's a region called Perea. Now, it's interesting to note that Perea is under the rule of, of Herod, Herod Anipus. And there's, there's a reason that that makes sense or a reason that that might have some interest here. Because the questions that they're asking him, I believe they're asking for multiple reasons. One, they really do want to know what Jesus' perspective on divorce is because at a certain time, Moses in Deuteronomy had basically said that you could write a certificate of divorce for your wife and divorce her. And the Pharisees had carried this on and basically had drawn it to new extremes where basically they were writing certificates of divorce for any reason. You may have heard in history Josephus or other people talking about the fact that some of these Pharisees would write a certificate of divorce because their wife had burned dinner or because they simply found her unpleasing and found someone else more pleasing. And so they were taking incredible license with this law that Moses had given them in Deuteronomy and they wanted Jesus' view on it. And it becomes fairly clear that Jesus' view is in some, some major type of opposition to their view. But there's another thing going on here. Like I said, Perea is under the rule of Herod. And if you remember a few chapters ago in Mark chapter 6, or if you weren't with us, I'll fill you in. Mark chapter 6 recounts the story of Herod Antipas beheading John the Baptist. It's a long story that we won't get into that's very entertaining. It's like the stuff of movies. But essentially, Herod's wife's daughter asked for John the Baptist's head on a platter, and he complied. Well, why did he have John the Baptist in the first place, and why were Herod's wife and daughter so angry at him? Because Herod had taken his brother's wife. Herod had taken his brother's wife, and John the Baptist spoke out against it. Herod was not happy about this, that John would say, listen, this does not please God. This is not in his plan. What you've done in this category of divorce and remarriage, this is called sin. And so he, he put John the Baptist in jail and then was basically tricked into beheading him. And it's interesting, the Pharisees know that Herod is ruling this area, and you got to wonder, are they hoping that Jesus said something or says something that gets him in trouble with Herod? Are they hoping that maybe like John the Baptist, he says something and maybe they can get rid of Jesus? But in the midst of it, they're also wondering, what's he going to say? Because we want to see if he goes against the law of Moses. And Jesus, being the genius that he is, is so clever, so accurate, so articulate with the way that he deals with it to reveal God's desire and God's original intention. So what does Jesus do? Well, what I love and what you see that he does is that he immediately links marriage to creation and links it to God in creation. He takes it out of their hands. He takes it out of the legal system. He takes it back to before Mosaic law and he roots it into creation and says, listen, you're talking about rules and legal things and can I write a certificate of divorce and can I not? He's talking a lot like 
our world does about divorce, or, or the Pharisees are, rather. They're talking about the way our world talks. See, in our world, sadly, divorces come to basically just the dissolving of a legal contract. You drive down the freeway and you see a sign that says $49 in a week and you can have your divorce. Easy, cheap, as if it's not costly, as if it doesn't matter that much. Our world would want to lull us into a thinking that marriage and divorce are not that big of a deal. And Jesus' first move is to say, you got this all wrong. You think this is a legal thing. You think this is about rules. And let me tell you, it's not. And he roots it into creation. In fact, in Mark 10, if you're open there, in verse chapter 6, he says this. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. And then he says this, what therefore God has joined, let, no, let not man separate. In Malachi 2.16, we get this basic statement from God that says, I, the Lord God, hate divorce. Jesus basically reiterates that, this in this passage. There's nothing good about divorce. I don't like divorce. I hate it. What God joins, don't let anyone separate. And there's three things to note about verse 6. From the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. In the original language, there's an article there. So it basically says God made them a male and a female. When God created humanity, he could have done anything that he wanted. He could have created a group of people that got to choose their partner and how they wanted to do things and how they even wanted to partner up, but he didn't. He created a male and a female, setting the tone for his institution, his creation of marriage. This was the original dating game, but there were no choices. There was one, and it was God's. And he said, a man and a woman. And that's why anything other than that is not God's plan for marriage. A male and a female. And then he says this, God made them male, male and female and therefore said, and this is a quote from Genesis chapter 2, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife or cleave to his wife. It literally means to glue, to be glued together, a permanent bond that has no intention of being broken. To be glued together. And then he further iterates that or reiterates that by saying the two shall become one flesh. They are no longer two, but one flesh. And it's not simply talking about a physical union between a man and a wife. It's talking about the spiritual union under God. It's talking about the covenant made, the joining, the supernatural spiritual connection that God does through marriage and in marriage. And so you see, when we look at marriage, if we get the idea or are influenced too much by the world around us, we can devalue the weight and the goal and the desire of God in marriage. We can believe the lie or begin to believe the lie that it is just a legal contract, and if it's that easy to dissolve it, then it must not be that big of a deal. And man, Satan wants you to believe that. But Jesus roots it into creation and says, this is not the way that it was supposed to be. In fact, from the beginning, divorce was never the intention. Divorce was never something that I ever, you know, that was not the desire of God. And the Pharisees have it all wrong, and they're basing it on this one passage in Deuteronomy chapter 24, which I think it's good for us to go there and to look at it at least, to see where they're coming from. So Deuteronomy chapter 24 verses 1 through 4. And, and just so you know, this is a little bit confusing, and I don't want to spend too much time in this because this is not necessarily the point. It's almost like a tongue twister because he's giving all these regulations. So forgive me if I stumble over it. You take a little bit of time and look at it as I read it. When a man takes a wife and marries her, if she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency her, in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends it out of his house, and she departs out of his house, and if she goes and becomes another man's wife, then the latter man hates her and writes her a certificate of divorce. This, is, this lady must be quite a peach. Um, and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house. Or if the latter man dies, there was a lot of that back in the Old Testament, who took her to be his wife, then the former husband who sent her away may not take her again to be his wife after she has been defiled. For this is an abomination before the Lord, and you shall not bring sin upon the land the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance. 
Now, from that passage, the Pharisees have built a theology of divorce that allows them to basically divorce for any reason, which was not the original intention of the passage. This was in no way God condoning divorce. No way God commanding divorce. In fact, at best, it was an allowance. At best, it, it was basically a concession by God because, as Jesus says, of the hardness of their hearts. He saw the sin in their hearts. He saw the sin in their land. He saw the, the immorality and all the wickedness going on. And for the peace of his people, and because God is gracious, he made a concession that did not change his view on divorce at all. God allowing Moses to give them a concession for divorce did not mean that God did not hate divorce or that he even hated it any less. He still did. And what this passage is talking about in Deuteronomy chapter 24 is actually a protection. It's bringing it back. What you see in that passage is that divorce clearly was already a part of their culture. Divorce clearly was already going on. And what Moses was doing was not saying, hey, I got a new idea for you. If you don't like your wife, you can just divorce her. Moses was saying, listen, you're all doing this. You're all following the world. You've been infiltrated by the pagan cultures around you and you're divorcing each other. I'm going to give you some restrictions on it to for the most part, protect the woman because in, in that day and age, they were devalued. In that day and age, men were, were, were oftentimes bullies and not treating women fairly, not treating women right. And so basically he's saying, listen, if a man writes the certificate of divorce and the woman goes and marries another, and then he writes her certificate of divorce, basically the first guy can't take her back. One, there's some, there's some adultery issues going on there. There's basically some issues of, of impurity going on there that God wants to protect his people from. But he also is protecting them from another thing. Because there were guys in that culture who would see that, that very situation, as an opportunity. Why? An opportunity because of this. When a woman would get married, her father would give her a dowry. She would take that gift, which was basically a huge gift to the daughter. She would take that into her marriage, and then it became basically the possession of the marriage, which meant the possession of the man. When he divorced her, he kept that dowry. She would get married a second time, let's say, and the father would give another dowry, another dowry to her, which then became the possession of the second husband. But if the second husband were to die, or the second husband were to divorce her, she kept that dowry with her. And then these first husbands who had divorced her already saw an opportunity to get another dowry. Saw an opportunity to take her back, remarry her, and have an opportunity to get another dowry and do it for financial gain. So God is saying, no, listen, we're not doing this. We're not playing this game. And so ultimately, God's hatred of divorce was never more clear than even in the fact that he's saying, listen, you have got to rein this thing in. This was not my original intention. My original intention was marriage forever, glued together, a permanent bond. And he basically shuts the Pharisees down. And he says, marriage is a covenant before God. It is created and instituted by him for our enjoyment in his glory. And it's not going to be trifled with by some nearsighted laws of men. And you know, when I read that and when I see that and I understand it, there's an encouragement that I receive out of it because we talk a lot about the sanctity of marriage. We talk a lot about protecting the sanctity of marriage, and I totally understand what that means, but I want you to know something. When I read this, I am not worried about the sanctity of marriage. You know why? Because we don't get to define it. We don't get to hold the sanctity of marriage. God upholds the sanctity of marriage. It is His we're wrong when we start to think that our laws and the way that we view marriage and the way that we do marriage and the way that we do divorce is ultimate. It is not. God is ultimate. He is our ultimate authority. He is the creator and the institutor of marriage. Therefore, the sanctity of marriage will never be in danger. What I am worried about is our response to God's upholding of the sanctity of marriage. What I am concerned about is not only in the world but in the church how we've devalued marriage to the place that we find divorce a somewhat trivial thing. This should not be. Christ tells us this should not be. In fact, we do not marry and divorce in a vacuum. God loves us. He desires the best for us. He gives us incredible gifts like marriage. 
And man, my marriage is a testament to that. The first two years, three years, they were terrible. But what God has done in my marriage since then is unbelievable. I, this might sound like a really simple thing or a stupid thing or an obvious thing, and it's like, you're a pastor, you should say this, and I wish I could convey or you could get some meter or put me on a lie detector. I realized the other day that, like, I truly do love my wife more now than I ever have. And I, I don't know why that shocks me. It shouldn't shock me, but maybe it's because I just see so many people in the world around us that that just isn't the case. And I counsel so many people in marriages, even here in the church, where that's not the case. And I look at it and I realize, that's not me. That's God's gift. That's His grace. And it's something that we should chase. It's something that we should seek. We should not be like these Pharisees looking for some type of way out. So uh, before we get into kind of some encouragements about marriage, I just want to conclude kind of the biblical perspective on marriage and divorce since it's where we're at. And you don't have to turn there, but in 1 Corinthians 7, basically verses 12 through 15, Paul, who's dealing with a church much like ours, gives basically some, some rules of engagement, if you will, when it comes to divorce and remarriage because it was something that they were dealing with in the Corinthian church. And, and to, to summarize it or to end it, he basically says this, listen, if you're in marriages and, and anyone wants to stay, then you should stay married. There is no doubt about it. And in fact, it even says in verse 10, something to the effect of God doesn't want any of you to be divorced. God desires for all to remain married. And it gives one caveat in verse 15. It says, if you have an unbelieving spouse that desires to leave, let them leave. And the language there is actually kind of strong. And it's interesting that God would put it that way, but when it says let them leave, that's an imperative, which is kind of a command, and he's not commanding divorce again. He's not even condoning divorce. What he's saying is if an unbeliever wants out, there's a sign there. There's a sign there that he wants to cause strife or she wants to cause strife, and God is giving you again a gracious, a gracious allowance for peace in your life because of that situation. And so what we see, basically here are kind of three points if you, if you want to sum up the Bible's view on divorce. God hates it. It's a really, really bad thing. But he allows it because of the sin of mankind in two situations. He allows it when there's been infidelity or sexual immorality, and he allows it when an unbeliever wants to leave or desertion. And so these are the two opportunities or the two, the two examples of times when divorce is allowed by God. And, and I, find, I, I find it very interesting that in our culture, and even among churches, what's really sad to me, what's really, I expect the world to act like the world. But I don't expect it from the evangelical church. That we seem to be looking for more excuses as to why to allow divorce instead of reasons to nurture and encourage marriages. So what I see from this passage and what I learn is I want to stay away from divorce as much as possible. Well, how do I do that? I nurture my marriage. I learn what it means to be a good husband. I learn what it means to be a good wife. So the rest of our time, these last 15 minutes, we're going to talk about nurturing your marriage. One large overarching point and then seven more behind it that basically fall right off of it. And some of these may not seem super linear or organized. This is basically me sharing my experiences and my thoughts from my own marriage and also the, the, the people that I have ha had the opportunity and privilege to counsel in marriage. And so here's the first thing that I get straight out of this passage. If marriage is rooted in creation, if marriage is rooted as God's institution, then guess what? Marriage is not about you. Marriage is not about you. It's about God. Every day, your sin nature and the world around you is trying to convince you that your marriage is about you. And when you're not happy and when you're not satisfied, there is a problem. But like we talked about before, this is just not the case. Marriage is God's. It belongs to God. In fact, that's why Jesus says, if you divorce and it's not a biblical divorce and you marry another woman that's adultery and you go, well, no, no, that doesn't make sense. How could that be? Because we're thinking in a legal mindset, I've got the paper that says I would divorce from her, and adultery is when you're having relations with someone outside of marriage. How does this, I don't understand, how does this work? Well, here's why. Because in God's economy, he says, listen, I created marriage. 
I'm the ultimate authority. This is not some simple contract that you signed in the state of Arizona, that Arizona now has the right to dissolve. You made a commitment. You made a covenant before God when you got married. And he upholds that covenant. And so when you say, I don't want this anymore, and God says, listen, I haven't allowed for divorce in your situation because there hasn't been marital unfaithfulness, and you don't have an unbeliever wanting to desert you. You just kind of want your own way, or you just figure, oh, it's better for everybody. Man, we hear that all the time. This is better for everybody. It's even better for the kids. They don't want to see us fighting. This is going to be better for everybody. God says, no, it's not. And he says, guess what? The reason I call it adultery is because you're still married, because your divorce the, 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 the separation of your union is not legitimate in the eyes of the Bible. And so it's easy to see that. God desires that we gain the gift of marriage His way. So marriage is not about you, it's about God. In fact, in 1 Corinthians eleven three, it gives this kind of cool illustration. It says that Christ, uh, but I want you to understand, here it is. The head of every man is Christ, the head of the wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. And here's what this points to. It points to that if the head of the wife is her husband, but it's supposed to look like this. Don't get caught up on the head like I'm the, like the husband is the leader. Yeah, roles, yes. But look at what he's comparing it to. He's comparing it to the relationship of Christ and man, us. So Christ and his church. And he's comparing it to the relationship of Christ and God. In the Trinity, there is perfect equality. Christ is God. There's no inequality there. But yet their roles, they perfectly submit to and honor one another. And that's what he's talking about. Listen, as a marriage, as a married couple, you have the opportunity to present the gospel to the world around you in your marriage the same way that Christ relates to his church, the way that Christ is gracious with his bride, the way that Christ loves his bride, is merciful, is compassionate, the way that we sin over and over again and God forgives and forgives and forgives. We have the opportunity to be that with our spouse and represent the gospel to the world around us. We also have this incredible opportunity to represent God as the Trinity and the perfect union of God and Christ in our marriage. Man, what an incredible opportunity to share the gospel and to share Jesus with the world around us when marriages are failing all around of us and we have healthy marriages that are desiring to be nurtured. So what does that look like? I'm sure there's tons of points we could put in here. Here's some that I've come up with and we're going to move quick through them, all right? Look for a way to be godly, not a way to get what you want. Number one, look for a way to be godly, not a way to get what you want. When the Pharisees came to Jesus, they were looking for a way to get what they wanted. In fact, that's what they're always doing. That's what their laws were about, to create loopholes so that they could do what they wanted. And so often, so often in marriage, it's very, very quickly revealed That the issues that people are having, the issues that we have, is that I want what I want, and when I don't get it, I'm dissatisfied. But in a godly marriage, I'm looking for an opportunity to display godliness, not an opportunity to get what I want. Matthew 22 shares the greatest commandment, to love the Lord your God with all your strength, your heart, your soul, your mind. And the second, he says, is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. In marriage, you have the greatest opportunity to obey both of these commands. You have the greatest opportunity to obey both of these commands. I want to read this, this quote that I, uh, I found. I've never even heard of this guy, but he said this. It takes three to make love work, not two. You, your spouse, and God. Then listen to this statement. Without God, people only succeed in bringing out the worst in one another. It's totally true. Without God, we only, we only proceed to bring out the worst in one another. I, I, a song that I'll never forget by a Christian artist a long, long time ago, it had this line and it said, if she's given her first love away, she can love you like nobody can. And the idea, the concept was this. If she loves God more than you, if you love God more than her, then you're going to display the gospel on a daily basis to one another and your marriage will be fruitful. It'll be awesome. And that's our goal. So look for a way to be godly. Number two, seek to serve, not to be served. Seek to serve, not to be served. In Philippians chapter 2, it talks about Christ, our ultimate example, and his humble service in coming to the earth, living the life that we should have lived, and dying the death that we should have died. The ultimate servant. 
I oftentimes ask myself this and would encourage you to ask yourself as well. What if Christ held me to the standard that I hold my spouse to? What if Christ held me to the standard that I hold my spouse to? When you're disappointed in something that your spouse does or says, and you feel it's your right to be upset or angry and not give grace, ask yourself this question, what if God, what if Christ was treating me or thinking of me the way that I'm thinking of her or him right now? Number three, in seeking to serve, you're going to definitely have to do this, but number three, pull the log out of your own eye pull the law out of your own eye. It's funny, in marriage, as soon as we learn what God says about marriage, we gain expectations. And as soon as we gain expectations, we set ourselves up to be disappointed. Because our expectations are typically not of ourselves, our expectations are typically of our spouse. If you're sitting in a message and Ephesians chapter 5 comes up and we talk about the roles of a husband and a wife and you're sitting there with your wife, you know, the husband's probably thinking, man, I hope she's hearing this. Preach it, brother. That's some good stuff. Submit, honor, respect, amen. Well, guess what? Your wife is thinking the same thing when you get to verse 25, and it says, love her the way Christ loved his church. So, yeah, why don't you try that once in a while? Why do we do that? Because even though it's so known and so common for us to know that expectations like that only lead to bad things. I mean, I, I, I found a couple of these quotes that, that I found interesting. Alexander Pope, blessed is he who expects nothing, for he shall never be disappointed. Even uh, the Bruce Lee, I'm not in this world to live up to your expectations, and you're not in this world to live up to mine. And then Donald Middle, a little bit more current, when you stop expecting people to be perfect, you can like them for who they are. Sometimes we need to pull the log out of our own eye, which obviously, it's a reference to Matthew chapter 7. And he says, judge not lest you be judged. Why are you running around trying to find what's wrong with everybody else instead of looking in your own heart, instead of looking in the mirror? He's saying, why are you looking at the speck in somebody else's eye? Oh yeah, that's what's wrong with you. You need to fix that. When you got this giant honking plank in your own face, pull it out. Take care of yourself hear a message and think to yourself, what is God saying to me? Not what is God saying to my wife? Not, man, I wish she was here. God speaks to us. Let him speak. Now we get to the ones that are a, a little bit more practical. Number four, keep romance alive. This one will be short because I am not an expert. I, I am not, I mean, my wife tells me all the time, you could certainly be a little bit more romantic. I said, well, I'm real, honey, and I love you. Romance is not, I, I, I suck at it. I, I mean, I, I am just not real good at it. I have to work at it. And let me encourage you guys, you might be in the same boat as me. You need to work at it. You should work at it. So I don't try and come up with it on my own. I, I look to other people who are better at it than I am. Song of Solomon is a book that is devoted to romance. Before marriage, through marriage, after marriage. And what I learned from that is that we need to be people who enjoy one another, who enjoy our spouse. 1 Peter 3, verse 1 and 2, and then again in 3, verse 7, basically says, and we don't need to, to read it, or, it, it basically speaks of understanding one another. It speaks of, speaks of having uh, respect and love for one another. And in 7, it says, husbands likewise live in an understanding way, likewise with your wives living in an understanding way with you. We need to learn the language of our spouse. We need to learn what makes them light up and say those things and do those things. I read this, uh, Zig Ziglar, who's a well-known evangelical, says this. Number one, spoil each other. Number two, express appreciation. Number three, know when to apologize. Man, I have, I have got that one down because I have lots of opportunities to do it. But I want to I tell you, I was counseling a couple that were getting ready to be married, and they were going through a little bit of tension, and it became apparent to me that, that in this particular situation, the husband had apologized profusely, and the wife had not apologized at all. And I began to pry and ask a little bit, and I found out that the wife, in their dating relationship of years, had never apologized to him for anything. And this continued to be something that was extremely difficult for her in marriage. 
you want to not nurture your marriage, think you're perfect. You want to give your husband a way to struggle, your wife a way to struggle, guys, don't apologize. Trust me, you will have plenty of opportunities to put this into practice. Know when to apologize and do it often. Then he says, take time out, develop a sense of humor about yourself. Know that gifts matter. And then David Clark gives these nine rules of romance, which I mean, these are high standards. Gosh, I feel like, guys, if we're doing two or three of these, we're probably pretty good. One date a week, hold hands, which, by the way, my wife loves this, and I have to admit it. Even as a manly man, this is super encouraging. I walked outside, and I came around because I needed to, to go use the restrooms here, and I walked in behind a couple that were probably 70 years old holding hands on their way into church. That is so cool. That is so sweet. My wife and I still hold hands, just not the same way. Because, you know, we used to do that whole interlocking thing, but now my knuckles are so fat that we'd, like, get them lodged in place there. <laughs> so we have to figure out creative ways. Watch romantic movies, candlelight dinners at home, write cards and letters, a weekend getaway. Basically, do the things that you used to do when you weren't married and you wanted her to know that you really liked her. Or ladies, you wanted him to know that you really were interested in him. Do those things. Keep romance alive. Don't give up. I hear it way too much. I'm done. I can't do this. But don't give up. Let those, ring, those words ring in your head. Maybe you're in this room right now and you're going through the fire. You're going through the struggle where these things are hard. Do not give up. The investment you place in marriage is so worth it. Number six, get help. This doesn't mean professional counseling. It doesn't mean professional help, but it means biblical help. It means that maybe there's some other couple sitting very near you, someone in your small group, or maybe you need to get involved in a small group where people, we are the body of Christ. We should be walking together with one another through these things and encouraging each other daily, as Hebrews chapter 3.13 says, encouraging each other daily, which literally means counseling one another daily that we may not be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. And we need to do this together and do this for one another, which leads us right into the last point, be help. I'm sitting here and I see lots of people that I know, lots of people that I recognize. And I've, I've known you guys for years and I know you have an awesome marriage and it's going really, really well. And what encourages me is that we have a room full of a lot of people who could be help. Who could follow God's example. Who have followed God's example. Who have made their marriage about God. And you could reach out to people around you and make yourself available to counsel people who are not doing well who are not putting God at the center of their marriage, to compassionately and lovingly and like Christ walk them through what that looks like and hold their hand as it is a struggle and as it, is, it is tough. I mean, my biggest encouragement is that, or my biggest encouragement to you is that when we think of our marriages and we think of the fact that it's about God and not us, that we would see the opportunity to live the gospel through our marriage that we would see that God is a God of reconciliation. He loved us so much that he reconciled our deep, dark hearts to himself. How can we not desire in our marriage the, most, the, the closest example of who Christ is to us that we can ever have in our life? How can we not desire reconciliation when there's tension or an argument? Let's live the gospel in our marriages. Amen? Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your word and God, for your encouragement in Mark chapter 10. God, we love you. God, my desire is to glorify you with my life, to glorify you with my marriage. And God, I pray that as we leave this room, that is our desire as well. God, may we glorify you with our lives in everything. We pray this in your name. Amen.